Hi, welcome back to Brooks's Bass Corner. Today I have an interview for you with the legendary Slapmaster himself, Mr. Larry Graham, taken from an interview here in London back in March 2013. If you enjoy the video, please hit the subscribe button below, hit the notification bell, and give us a thumbs up. Enjoy the video. You started out um, in a singing band when you were a child. Um, you also played guitar, organ, drums. Mm -hmm. Have you always sung? Was that always with you, kind of from as a as a really young kid? Were you singing in choirs and no, in church? No, uh, I was raised up um, in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and uh, so the music <laughs> it was quite different in the Catholic Church. Um, later on in my teen years, um, I did attend a number of other uh, churches other than Catholic, uh, but by then. Um, I have been studying music for quite some time, uh, as you mentioned, the gu guitar, and bass, drums, but uh, also in school I took up clarinet and saxophone. Wow. So I started getting into the to the horns. Um, but musically, um, my roots weren't uh, in in the church. It was really um, in music outside the church. So what was going on around you in your neighborhood? Mm -hmm. But you know, if you remove the lyrics, um, a lot of the music is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. You know, but when you insert, um, you know, religious type words, sometimes that's what would make a song yeah, sure. gospel yeah, or mm -hmm. whatever. If you take the lyrics off, and sometimes you, you can be able to tell the difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, your vocal range is very sort of baritone, and then going up. Um, was that in place before you picked up the bass? Because I know you, obviously, us being guys, our voices change in our teens. But did you find that your vocal range was in place before you picked up bass? Or uh, yeah. yeah. Um, when I was in junior high school, um, before the voice change, uh, I was into singing. And I used to love uh, Frankie Lyman. Wow. The teenagers, mm -hmm. why the fools fall in love. And so, sure. so my voice was high, yeah. you know. Uh, and then uh, a lot of guys go through a period where the voice is kind of like cracking and stuff yeah. like that. And I didn't go through that. You're a lucky guy. <laughs> mine, mine just, I just woke up and one day is, hi mom. <laughs> was that a big surprise? Did you think, oh, I've lost my voice or? It, no, it just it just changed, you know. You know, at some point you're gonna go from a boy to a man. You just don't know when that's gonna happen. And sometimes it starts. Did it concern you that you? That's okay. It's, okay. it's recording, but it'll be fine. Okay. Did, did, did it concern you that your voice had changed? Because someone who's a vocalist will think, oh. No, no. Um, it actually worked to my advantage because before. Then I was, um, like I say, singing, and I had a little singing group in school and stuff. But by the time my mother and I started working together, and her trio and playing clubs and lounges and stuff, um, my voice had already changed. And when she would, uh, when people would make requests for songs, you get your regulars to come in the club, and you have your little uh, tip jar on top of the tip glass on top of the piano, and people make a request, and if you know it, then they put a tip in there. Yeah. And so um, she would cover all the uh, lady stuff, the Elephants, Gerald down in Washington, mm -hmm. Sarah Vaughn, uh, you know, down the shore, whoever had a, a popular songs and uh, the classics. She would cover those, and then all the guy stuff, since my voice had already changed, I'd get all the Nat King Cole, the Billy Eckstein, the Frank Sinatra, and Tony Bennett and stuff. I, I'd feel those requests. And, uh, and so that was, that was during the time of the transition from guitar to bass. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so your range then was already in place before you... Before I actually picked up the bass, my yeah. voice had already changed. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, um, did playing piano and guitar before you picked up bass, did that help to establish your singing voice and to train your ear? Oh, yeah. 
because I know a lot of bass players, and obviously you get people like Sting and Paul McCartney, Mark King, who was with you last night, um, they find it, or, or having sort of read interviews with them and spoken to them, they find it quite easy, because they've practiced it, to sing and play bass. But a lot of players find it quite difficult because usually the rhythm you're singing is different to the rhythm you're playing. It's true. Um, so is that something you find you have to work at constantly, or is it now like a second nature? You just it's it's an instant. It's yeah, maybe because you put in the groundwork as a as a kid. Yeah, it was just you'd already developed that habit of mm -hmm. being able to do that. Yeah, because when my mother and I worked together um, before bass, I was playing the bass lines on the guitar, and when she solo and when I solo, she played bass lines on the piano. Yeah, most of my guitar bass lines was coming from her left hand. Yeah. So when I made the transition to bass, um, basically I'm still playing her left hand, uh, uh, the heavy influence. Uh, but as far as the coordination is concerned, I had already been playing the guitar yeah. at the same time playing the bass pedals with my on foot the, on the organ, on yeah. the organ, and at the same time singing. So I really had three things going at the same time. You're multitasking the, before yeah, multitasking yeah, existed. Yeah, yeah, I had three things going at the same time, but. Um, Did you find as a child, uh, they always say when you're a child you adapt to things much quicker than when you're older. Did maybe you find so. It, it became, uh, it was kind of inbuilt, you were doing it so often that it was very, if, for example if I now tried, if you weren't able to do that now and I got you to try and do it, you might think actually you know, I can't do three things at once. Well but yeah. as a kid you just kind of. And you don't, you don't think about it, it's, it's like, because I was doing the two things the guitar and singing at the same time already. And so, but you find, I guess you were finding more then, more guitar players that were singing. Sure. Yeah, come to think of it, you know, there were more guitar players that were singing at the same time than bass players mm -hmm. that were singing. Well, we're always put to the back, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, you know? we're usually in the background. And, <laughs> and we're the failed guitarists that yeah, can't play. And, and we're not out front, it's not required. Yeah. You know, we're more of the rhythm section. Uh, but in the case with working with my mother, I was singing lead and playing the guitar. So those two things went naturally together. But then when I added the bass pedals, that was really out of necessity. And I just did it because it was it was there yeah. to do. And so I didn't think of it. If I had thought about it, I probably would have thought, you know, I'm not supposed to do three things at one time. So do you think <laughs> maybe you, doing that with your mum gave you a head start over the bulk of the other bass players that were on the scene? You were probably maybe ahead of them? Well, yeah, yeah, because then when it got down to just playing bass and singing, I was actually relieving myself of one other task, sure. a third thing. Mm -hmm. So when I'm playing, actually, I don't really think about it for the most part. So you, do you find you can just go on autopilot and do it? I go, yeah, my, my bass becomes like a third arm, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just another extension of my body where I'm functioning that and using that part of my body, but I'm not thinking about it. I'm really thinking more about entertaining overall. Yeah. Thinking about the singing, uh, thinking about the crowd, sure. you know, and the audience, and the maybe moves. the little moves the in moves. there. Yeah. The man's got the moves. Got to add the third, <laughs> add the third thing back anyway, right? <laughs> if you ever come out of autopilot, and I've said, I've asked this of various musicians, if you come out of autopilot and for some reason you start to think what you do, do you lose your thread? It hasn't happened so far, for the most part, um, because it is on on autopilot. Um, I, I don't really, really think about it I guess the only time my focus will shift some is if I'm doing something that's only bass mm -hmm. like maybe in the studio sure um, or maybe playing on somebody else's stuff yeah you know where I am the bass player mm -hmm. you know so do you find it and I've, I've asked this of singing bass players before do you find if you're not singing it doesn't feel as natural because you're used to doing it so often that if you aren't singing and then you're playing the bass, it's suddenly that's my focus rather than my voice. And that can sometimes throw you a curve. Well, see, coming from working with my mother, you know, I did both. Sometimes I'm playing in the background while she's taking the lead. Yep. And then sometimes I'm taking the lead. So I kind of got used to, to, to that. And my band before her, when I was the guitar player, then I'm mostly 
in the front yeah. as the lead singer and lead guitar player. But with her, I'm doing both. And then with Sly and Family Stone, I'm doing both. Yeah. Sometimes I'm singing lead, and sometimes Freddie or Sly or Rose, somebody else is taking the lead, and I become just the bass player. You know, so uh, I, I can do either one and I'm comfortable with it. My, my focus doesn't really shift. I'm playing the exact same thing I would sure. be playing sure. if I was singing the part. Um, maybe if I was creating, let's say, in a creative environment and was doing both instead of one at a time, maybe that might make a difference. I don't know. Because okay. uh, sometimes even in that situation, um, you're thinking about vocals at the same time you're coming up with the part. Mm -hmm. You know, what's gonna go with that. Uh, for example, hair. Yeah. Obviously I wrote on the bass. That's yeah. it's everything is built around the bass. Yeah. So I'm And the drum pattern that's working. And the drum pattern. But I'm really thinking bass first. Then I'm thinking the drums that's gonna accompany that. Yeah. And I'll come up with with that pattern in my head. But then a song like today, I, I started that on the piano, yeah. and I'm not really thinking bass no. <laughs> so much. You know, I'm well, thinking you're doing. Yeah, I'm thinking Tom about the keyboard, the and then yeah. next, you know, the vocals that's going to go with that. Now, create a bass line that's going to complement that mm. piano stuff, which is the usual bass player's role. Yeah, exactly. Or whoever's going to come on piano, and guitar, and then we fit in around yeah. that basic framework. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And so then I'm yeah I'm trying to use the bass line to kind yeah. of. Be I was, I was going to ask you, um, obviously in the vocal range you've got, quite low voice, do you find um, that, has that ever been um, a problem or do you find it makes playing and singing easier? And what I'm alluding to is a lot of the front men singing bass players have quite high registers. Sting's got a very high voice, mm -hmm. Paul McCartney's got a very high voice. Mm -hmm. A lot of bass players sometimes find it's hard to sing in that lower range because their bass is doing it. They tend to either sing in falsetto or at least have a higher range. But do you find you're able, I know you are because I've, I've seen you do it, but you're singing in a similar register to what you're playing. Mm -hmm. That never causes an issue in what you're hearing? No, it's, it's kind of like... Because um, when I have to do backing vocals and I'm doing harmonies with a singer, if they ask me to take a lower one, I, I really struggle mm -hmm. because I'm listening to what my bass is doing and it's ingrained. Yeah. If I go for a falsetto, I can hit anything. Um, and I can hear the harmony, but if I try and do it lower, I'm struggling because I'm already playing. Yeah, yeah. For me, um, it, it, it's kind of like how can I explain it? It's kind of like um, there are some bass players that I've played with, mm -hmm. and we can play at the same time and totally complement each other. I saw the clip with you, and Marcus Miller. Yeah, that's a good example. Because also he plays his bass lines as. A vocalist, yeah. and I find his bass lines very often are, are a vocal line. There a melody. you go. There you go. So we, when him and I got together, uh, it's, it's 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 totally we complement each other. Yeah. Totally, even playing uh, both four string basses, mm -hmm. you know. But it's the bass lines. Stanley Clark, when he and I play together, you know, although he'll do the piccolo bass, mm -hmm. uh, but still the bass parts they don't clash because of his choice of parts mm -hmm. to go along with what I'm playing. Um, same thing happens with Prince. He and I can play together. Yeah. Um, you find there's an empathy with these people. They yeah. understand where you're both coming exactly. from. Exactly. I guess with Marcus Miller also, he grew up listening to you. Yes, It would be yes. like if I was playing along, for example, with Mark King or John Taylor or yeah. Nate Watts. I would yeah. know their tracks. And you would know. I would know those frameworks. Yeah. And well, it's the same thing with singing in the same register as you're playing. Mm -hmm. You know yourself. Okay. So I know how to stay out of the way of myself yeah. with my voice. You know, same way I can play with another musician in that clash. I know myself yeah. better than they do even. So I, it's even easier yeah. for me to do okay. bass voice with bass. One, one of the first times I came across your vocal prowess, because I picked up a bass in uh, 87 when I was still at school kept hearing this name, Larry Graham, Larry Graham. Uh, at that time here in the UK, trying to get Graham Central Station material was quite hard. We didn't have the internet. Mm -hmm. You couldn't find the albums unless you went into a record shop that was sort of, Camden was a good place to try and find it. Mm -hmm. But the first time I heard you singing was uh, 
on Santana's Milagro album. You did oh, a cover yeah. of uh, Right On, yeah, Marvin, Marvin Gaye. Gaye. Yeah. And that was the first time I heard you sing I heard it on the radio, I was like, okay, right, now I'm getting a, a feel, because I hadn't heard the bass either, yeah. apart from the Sly Stone stuff. Yeah. How did that come about? Are you good friends with Santana? And obviously you go way back yeah. to that time. <laughs> we go all the way back to Woodstock. Yeah. And, um, and is that a friendship that's just carried on through the years? the years. Yeah. And then we're both from the Bay Area. Right. You know. Yep. And uh, then uh, Carlos is bass player, and I met backstage at Woodstock. Mm -hmm. And we developed a friendship that we were like the best, best of friends. Right. Yeah, we were really, really tight. So, yeah, the relationship with Santana goes way back. Okay. Was that your choice of track? To, did you no, no, suggest no. that? He, he, you know, he suggested it. He loved the song. and. Uh, his first decision was that he wanted me to be uh, on his album. Mm -hmm. So, and then what song? Well, he chose uh, the song to do. Yeah. It'd be that and another song, uh, Too Sweet Black Cherry Fire. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that was his choice. So, uh, with, with that song, um, it was totally about vocals. It wasn't about. Sure. Uh, yeah. I don't even think I played bass on that. No, I think, no, I I think, think I it, was, it was just the vocals. It was just the vocals. So I pulled so I'm the CD out over the weekend. I thought, well, yeah, yeah I put on just the total vocal hat okay. on that. You know. And a good job, too. Oh, thank well you. Well done, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you're multi instrumentalist. Do you find that makes the bass playing side easier for you because you're already knowing what everyone else is playing? Uh, for example, with Mark, Mark King that got up last night, he was a drummer. First, mm -hmm. which sometimes surprises people, sometimes it doesn't, because his playing style, like yourself, very percussive, mm -hmm. you're finding rhythms that would normally be played in the drums. So did you find moving to bass, once you'd done drums, piano and guitar, made it very easy and flexible for you to move over to bass? I, I think it, it, it uh, affect, affected my uh, choice of notes and patterns, mm -hmm. um, being a drummer first. Um, I think if I didn't have knowledge of drums, I might not be um, as uh, conscious of staying out the way. Mm -hmm. um, I think another uh, thing, too, is that after the, not working with a drummer for so many years with my mother, the first drummer that I then began to play with was Gregorico. Yeah. yeah I, did yeah. he ask you to lay back a little, maybe? No, that's, that's what I was going to say, is that uh, it was going to be very interesting how that was going to work. Either either it was going to be something that was going to work, and it was going to be just totally cool having a drum again, or it was going to be a train wreck. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and I didn't know which it would be. But Greg, being the kind of drummer he is, totally just played around what I was already doing. He didn't try to, hey man, won't you lighten up on this? Or like, you <laughs> Too know, busy. you're kind of getting in my way, uh, you know. That never happened. It was just like a, a natural, and I don't know, maybe. Uh, That's good empathy. Yeah, and, and it, it may have had something to do with the genius of Sly too, because he, he picked Greg. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know Greg. Yeah. Uh, he picked me. Uh, Greg didn't know me. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Sly picked me based on hearing me play along with my mother without a drummer. Yeah. See, he, he heard that, and it was his choice to put me together with Greg. Right. Okay. But then keeping in mind that Sly is multi-talented as well. He, he uh, I've heard that he might have been the... the uh, uh, the bass player in the band. Uh, he plays excellent bass, as mm -hmm. you've heard on some of sure. the, the records. Uh, like, uh, you can make it if you try. Yep. You know, the bass line on that is incredible. And so he chose me, being a bass player himself, having already picked Gregorico. Mm -hmm. So he knew what he was putting together. Yeah. You know, So it could have been a combination of that and Greg being such a good drummer. Yeah. Good just listener. And right. a good listener, you know, and just never competed with me for space. So you found, yeah, so you had yeah, there was no space to put your space. part in. 
Yeah. Great. Uh, even though now Greg it doesn't play the most uh, simple drum lines, um, they are simple, but well chosen spots. Mm -hmm. Not putting stuff where you would normally hear them. Yeah. Like on Sing a Simple Song, that 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 bass drum part, or dance to the music. Yeah. Nobody had played patterns like that before. Mm -hmm. And now he's complicated with his, you know. He got that thing. But going. as a result, your line. But now I'm simple. Complimented it. Yeah. yeah. I'm complimenting yeah. that. I'm playing simple. I'm playing. Not very much at all. Yeah. You know, I'm doing more thumping. But it works for the song. But it works, works for the groove. For the song. Some other songs, I'm more complicated yeah. than he has a more simple pattern. Yeah. Okay. Um, in that period with Sly Stone, um, how much effect did he have on the bass lines that you would come up with? Would he give you guides or would he just say, Larry, you do what you want to do and we'll work around that? Um, was he directing any of your parts back then? Or? Uh, again, um, you know, part of the genius of, of Sly and the success of the band is that he allowed us to be ourselves. For example, that drum line that I was just playing mm -hmm. on Dance to the Music, um, you know, Greg, you know, is Greg, mm -hmm. and that's how that drum line, uh, it just came from his heart. If somebody go and try to change that, in other words, if Sly were to say, okay, play it, this way, this is how I hear it in my head. This is how I hear the bass part in my head. This is how I hear Freddie's guitar part in my head. Nobody could play drums like Greg. So if yeah. you don't let him be himself, mm -hmm. you're going to miss out on something. Yeah. Nobody played rhythm guitar like Freddie Stone. Nobody on the planet. Mm -hmm. You go and try to change that because of what you hear in your head, you're going to miss out on something. It's a bit, they see some of the parts rather than the individuals. Yeah. yeah. And so by allowing me to be myself and not try to change me up because you are a bass player too. He didn't thump me. That wasn't what he created, but he allowed me to do what he heard me do. That's the reason for asking me to be the group. So he allowed us, especially the rhythm section, to be ourselves. And then that way he was getting the best out of each one of us. Yeah. He could have very well done everything himself like he did later on, uh, starting with maybe there's a riot going on, yeah. a lot of the parts he played himself, yeah. which was also good. Mm -hmm. Some things he would do and then let us come in and replace uh, his parts, and some of his parts he kept, some of them he you know, okay. kept all the parts. Yeah. But by allowing us to be ourselves, I think that was like the best. That's a good band leader. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, you might as well not have them there. You might as well do it. Yeah, so. yeah. Or Which just I think, copy, just here's the bass line, learn this and play I this. I think in the current environment, I mean, you've got lots of people working with Logic and Pro Tools and what have you. You get lots of people, certainly as a bass player, finding that um, sort of session work has declined because people want to do it themselves and they can. And then they wonder why the groove doesn't sit. Well, you haven't got a drummer and a bass player doing it. Exactly, exactly. Wonder why this record is not hanging around yep. like some of the records from the 60s mm -hmm. and the 70s and so. the 80s. Why is it that after a few months you forget about the song? Mm -hmm. It's because it's not reaching the heart okay. of the people. I mean, even as a drummer and a bass player too, when you plan a song the, and, and you're not using a metronome or a machine, the emotion of the song is felt because if the music is coming from the heart, yeah. when you get to high parts and as the song builds and stuff, the tempo changes. Sure. You're not locked on 126. Emotionally, you might go up to 130 by the time you get to, the, you know, to the end, and it may. So that's heart music, letting it come out of the heart, and in that way, you're communicating with the hearts of others. When you're locked in, somebody else might not know why, but emotionally, they're just not feeling it. It's not living. It's, it's not so living. It's not breathing. You know, so it, you know, it's not going to stick in your heart as long. Next thing you know, a few months later. It's like, what's new? <laughs> Go on to the next one. The next one, yeah, sure. Um, the period when you left Family Stone, was Graham Central Station already sort of in your mind? Possibly, I don't mean to say it was set up before you left, but was the idea already there before you left? Not for Graham Central like Station. Or was it like you left one and then think, right, I've got to have this new project, and then got it up and running? No, I, I, 
starting another band uh, and Did you find it, it daunting? Doing that? It wasn't my intent. Right. Um, uh, I had been um, all along, as well as Freddie and Greg, um, writing songs. Yeah. Um, so, but for Sly and the Family Stone, Sly was the writer and no one had an issue with that. But at home, you know, we were all writing. Mm -hmm. um, my first thought was um, starting a group that I would produce and that I would write for. Mm -hmm. And so I had already written tons of stuff at home um, and played all the stuff myself at my, you know, like everybody else was doing this at home, mm -hmm. just for the purpose of writing. So I would put this group together and this girl, uh, Chocolate, Patrice Banks, we call it Chocolate, my thought was to put, build the group around her. Mm -hmm. So that was the name of the group, Hot Chocolate, which yeah. is not the same as the one that Emma had Brown's to later. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> but Hot Chocolate and the group would be built around her and then take the songs that I had written and let her sing the leads mm -hmm. on it. That was the thought. And so I started taking things in that direction and then one night, uh, the group had a show to play live over at Bimbo's over in San Francisco. And uh, I was there, the crowd knew that the band was a group that I had put together, and they knew the connection between me and Sly and the Family Stone mm -hmm. and all that. So I'm in the audience, the band is playing, the show is going great, get down toward the end of the show, and all of a sudden, the attention start being focused on me, like <laughs> urging me to get up there, right? And I went up and sat in, band at the end and being the writer and producer of the band and knowing the music and the whole thing that was an instant connection and you know everything just elevated to another level and so the band knew I knew the crowd knew something that just happened mm -hmm. that was special cool. and so then I obviously had to be a, in the band now it wasn't yeah. my intent but after that night it's like man I got natural circumstances. it was a natural thing and then I just changed the name mm -hmm. to Graham Central Station and then uh, started doing more of the okay. leads myself. Okay. Um, in that sort of late 60s, early 70s period, obviously James Brown, yourself, uh, I guess Tower of Power was starting to appear. Did you find um, with all this, the funk sort of starting up, did you find yourself, not necessarily in competition, but did you find there was like the James Brown side of things and yourselves, did you find that you were, I've written, did you feel you were in competition with the likes of Bootsy? Was it like the best bass player in town, like a, you know, a Western, the hottest shot in the, yeah. in the West? Or, or was it really, you were both aware of each other and you're both doing your separate things? Uh, yeah, and it's still like that. We were both aware of each other and it was different. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there was a, um, they were related obviously there's like cousins uh, but not necessarily you know blood brothers you know there's there's a difference yeah um, did you find there was like a mutual respect between yourselves you knew respect. what both of you were trying to do and you were both going along a similar road just in side by side yeah rather than the yeah and it was you know when you listen to Bootsy there's no mistake about who that is mm -hmm. you know he has a very definite sound and way of playing and just this whole thing is, but it's related, but different. So there was never any competition or even to this day, uh, we've been on the same bill um, and uh, it's no competition. We just both enjoy what each other Great. does. and Brings to the table. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And just okay. pick what each other do. Cool. Um, last night's appearance. Uh, got Mark King to come up with you, obviously uh, from the UK. Um, have you been aware of Mark's playing over the past 30 years? Or at, at what point were you aware of him? Because obviously Level 42 didn't break into the US until the mid 80s. Yeah. And really they've had no profile in the best part of 20 years. Yeah, but bass three players know about other bass players. Sure. <laughs> and for, for me, there was a long period of time where um, well, I, I went through a period where I hadn't, uh, I didn't really realize my influence on other bass players, mm -hmm. especially in the beginning, you know, we didn't have videos and 
all that stuff for people to see what I was doing, so they didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. But then as we did more concerts and TV shows, more bass players became influenced, or even cover bands to cover our songs, you had to yeah. play my style. Over a period of time, I became more and more aware of other bass players playing like me. Mm -hmm. uh, then when we moved into the Graham Central Station period, now I really knew because there was more and more and more. And then yeah. through that whole period, too, it got to a point to where even people who were playing in other genres of music, thumping and plucking and slapping the bass. And so you become aware of those people, but ne not necessarily every song that they put out on the album. Sure. But you're aware of them uh, as a bass player because to me, they're like they're like you know my my little bass children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I I feel like it touches my my when I see somebody pull that thumb back, you know, as opposed to playing to the overhand style, which I have high respect for too, because um, I love however you want to play it. But when I see you pull that thumb back, then I know that's another one of my children. Well, last yeah. night, uh, when I run the, the review of the show, it will be titled The Meeting of Thumbs. <laughs> you know, just, uh, I mean, because Mark has said on, on many occasions what a big influence you were. Uh, Bernard Edwards yeah. from Chic, obviously the Jacko stuff. Yeah. Um, and during that sort of fusion era of sort of the mid to late 70s, he gets a lot of his side from that, but also then there's your side and there's Boots' side and he's a big James Brown fan. So, it's again, it's like putting everything into the melting yeah. pot and that's what's come out. Exactly. So, exactly. Okay. Um, I've seen you do a couple of shows and although you do use effects and I've got some nice shots of your pedal board, you don't overuse them. And I know for bass, and I've always had this argument with some drummers, they'll say, bass is bass, don't, don't use effects. But what comes across in your playing is that rather than... Um, overusing it you're giving your sound a different flavor maybe mm. spicing up the tone yeah. just throwing the audience a curve on the sound so it's not just boom, 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 boom. Yeah. we've got the uh, you've got the fuzz sound you've mm -hmm. got your chorus and uh, uh, the Bigfoot mm -hmm. um, do you try out new pedals from time to time or do you just kind of settle with what you've got because um, I've got a copy of the DVD you did in Japan mm -hmm. um, back in the 90s mm -hmm. and actually looking at you board last night it's kind of similar there isn't you know the jet phase is still there yeah I know you use the Dan Electro mm -hmm. um, I did speak to Rhonda Smith a couple of years ago because when I think in a period when you weren't in Prince's band and she was doing their work in Europe and America mm -hmm. she had that yeah that sound and I said how are you doing that because I know what where your influence is yeah, coming yeah. from how are you doing that she said well when Larry was on tour with Prince didn't want to take the some of the pedals out because they weren't roadworthy because they might fall to bits yeah. she said then the closest thing we could find was the Dan Electro Fab yeah. Tone which for a pedal you can get on eBay for £20 yeah. it, it, it's that sound yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah do you, do you try out new stuff or are you quite sort of settled in what you have that's how I settle on the Dan Electro trying it out Yeah, yeah I'm always open to, to other sounds um, and I, I try to go for sounds that um, sound more like stuff that I used to use like mm -hmm. when I Pick the Dan Electro is because it sounds like stuff I used to use. It, it's not around no more, or yeah. like you said, it's not roadworthy. And uh, I'm always, always open. You know. Okay. Um, so do you actively try things out, or do you wait for people to approach you with, you know, like a tech might say, "Hey, we've got a couple of pedals. Do you want to try?" Yeah, them? yeah, yeah, both. And you know, I've been to the music store, and uh, you know, we'll go over and. My wife would patiently wait while I plug in a couple of things and okay. try it out and, and see, you know, because you never know. Because at one time, um, you know, when I started um, using the fuzz tone, um, bass players weren't using effects. Yeah. But coming from playing the guitar, I was thinking like a guitar player. So I didn't have a problem with experimenting. Mm -hmm. Hmm, what does it sound like if I plug this bass in there? Sure. Because um, I didn't have a problem with that. So it's the same thing with, with other pedals over the years. Um, you know, it's like, let me see what this jet face sounds like. Let me see what this fuzz face sounds like. Sure. And I try different things. So I'm always open. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, again, you know, I, I try to find stuff too that's closer to what I'm hearing in my head okay. with that, yeah. that electro. Uh, um, do you use much compression either on your amp or your pedal? You just go in clean and use natural dynamics? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was just something, because I, I know a lot of slappers sometimes will use that for when they're slapping, 
and then turn it off when they're playing finger style. Mm -hmm. But actually the thing that comes across in your playing is you're doing it all with your hands. So it's yeah. not robbing you of dynamics. Yeah, like last night I was using a volume pedal. I have used volume pedals yeah. before. But I try to do it more with, you know, dynamics with the way I'm playing mm -hmm. and stuff. And pretty much my bass is usually wide, you know, 90% of the time just wide open. Mm -hmm. And I just play harder or softer. Or okay, different. So just let the hands do mm -hmm. it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've also noticed um, when you're playing, your left hand thumb comes over the neck quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Is that more for comfort, or do it's you actually use it fret mode? <laughs> 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 kind of like this thing okay. over there. Okay. No, no, no. I use it to. Um, do you use it to fret notes? Mm, yeah, on occasion. I, 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 occasionally. Yeah. Okay. Occasionally. Yeah. Um, now we've got the four string sunshine there. Yeah. I know you have a five string called moonshine. Does yep. that ever get out an outing these days? Or? Not for live shows. Um, not for live shows because, um, like I mentioned earlier, when I play, it's on automatic pilot. Yep. And so I don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. But if you add that fifth string there, throw your curve. Uh, well, I can do it. Yep. But I do have to think about it. You know, and if I'm entertaining live, and also the string spacing can the string space, it's different. <clears throat> I can do it, mm -hmm. but I do have to think about it. Sure. Which I don't mind doing, but yeah. if I'm doing a show, I, I'm as the lead. Like for example, if I was just the bass player, yep. Then I have no problem with that. I guess also you got two keyboard players, so if you need that lower range, one of them yeah. can take care. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. Uh, I've used it on records. Mm -hmm. And I've used it playing with other folks, uh, with some Prince stuff, some mm -hmm. Shaka Khan uh, stuff. But then I'm not out in front of a crowd entertaining. Yeah. So I'm just playing and I, and I can think about it. Yeah. But for four strings, that's automatic pilot. So that's why I prefer that. But I love five string too. Sure. It's just, it's just a different which hat I'm wearing. Job. You know, if I'm okay. being out front lead dude, then mm. I want my four string. When uh, Moon made Sunshine for you, again, I got this from the DVD, you speak about um, refinements were made to Sunshine. Um, can you elaborate on those? Because I notice, obviously, the front neck pickup is angled slightly, maybe mm -hmm. give you more bass end on, on the lower strings. Also, you've got the uh, DI clip for the mic. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that was uh, a refinement? Yeah, mostly, mostly that, mostly that. Um, and then the design of the bass. When I first went to... Uh, it was about six months, maybe, maybe 20 something years, late 20 years ago. Okay. Um, and uh, Moon uh, came to the show, the representative, uh, Fumi, mm -hmm. and brought all kinds of uh, different Moon bases to show me the things that they were capable of doing. I had things in my head yep. of what I like about bases. Uh, I was aware of the music band. The, uh, jazz bass and so forth, G and L and so forth, and so I just kind of put m m some of my desires and what I'd like in the bass with what they had, and mm. that's what we came up with. Do you find? Um, I mean, I've seen you with that bass for quite a while. Yeah. Do you get stuff sent to you to try out, or is it just I'm happy with that? I don't need a lot of extra instruments sitting. There. Uh, yeah, War Warwick has. Uh, uh, Approach me about yeah. trying to make the maple a, necked um, make white a, one. Yeah, yeah, to make a, the, and they're, they're working on it. Is now. that for a signature model? Uh, yeah, it would be, and uh, so if they come up with something that's, you know, that's cool. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm not stuck on anything. No, sure. Any pedal that comes along that's going to be better or add something different, you know, and that's cool in my head, I, okay. or bass or whatever. You know, I'm open. Great. Yeah. Got best way to be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've literally got one more question and then I'll be done and then you can be with the lovely Tina, okay? Yeah. Um, I've picked up in interviews before, your mother, your grandmother, Tina and your children are your biggest influences. Yeah. Um, where do you still draw inspiration from musically and what keeps you so sprightly at the tender age of 66? Well, because I, I saw your show last night and you're defying the years. <laughs> I can't move like that and I've got 20 years on you. Well, um, uh, first of all, I think that what helps me to stay grounded is spiritually. Um, the number one thing in my life is trying to do what's
pleasing in God's eyes. So I think that that uh, definitely helps me to avoid things that could possibly do me harm, mm -hmm. you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and otherwise. So being far from perfect, um, but I do try um, to live according to things. I, before, you know, years ago, I'd make excuses as to why it's okay to do this or that, <laughs> try to fool myself. Deep in the back of my mind, it's like, man, you know that ain't right. <laughs> oh, come on now. You know, well, it comes from the earth, <laughs> you know, all kind of stuff. Yeah. But realistically, you know, by trying to please God first. And then the other thing is um, I'm blessed with a wonderful wife that uh, cares about me. We were friends before we even became interested in one another. And, she truly cares about me, and so she tries to take good care of me. Yep. She is concerned about what we eat. Uh, just before I came out the room a little while ago, I mean, there's all kinds of vitamins and herbs and stuff. Okay. And she, she be researching, trying to uh, keep us, you know, healthy and stuff. And then uh, I think um, our relationship, too, plays a major role because mm -hmm. Um, in 38 years, we just celebrated 38 years, oh February 8th, thank you. And uh, we've only been apart two days in 38 years. One for the Grammys, Grammys and one was the uh, Eddie Murphy session. Yeah. And I, I think having my best friend with me all the time, uh, she always got my back and she's always there to support me um, in any kind of way, you know. That's, that's needed, even on stage, you know, <laughs> on and off stage, you know, she's the everything person. So that really helps. And then our family, you know, our daughter is 15 minutes away with her husband and her three kids, our grandkids, we love 10, 6, and 4. And so we have them over all the time and little ones keep you, I mean, they keep you, you know, looking at SpongeBob and <laughs> you got to take them to Chuck E. Cheese and, you know. When we came here, they just all went to Disneyland, and we would have been there with them because we took them yeah. year before last to the West Coast of Disneyland. And, and just having that whole family interaction and stuff. Her sister just left um, Minnesota not long ago. Her mother is coming soon. We, we, we started to stay close to the family, and, you know, it keeps you focused, mm -hmm. you know, and I think by being more focused on spiritual things and family stuff, you're not as beat down by what's going on around you in the world because there's so much going on that could just drag you down. And that's why the name of the album is Raise Up. Yep. You know, it's Raise Up Above all that stuff that has the potential to drag us down on a daily basis or weekly basis. It's like, let's raise up above that. And certainly trying to serve God and have family around you helps to do that. And that, that affects the music. Yeah, that affects the music because, you know, there's one passage that I, I love to keep on mind is that out of the heart's abundance, the mouth speaks. So what's in here comes out here. So it's, it's going to come out here too. So if I'm happy in here, then it's going to come out in my music. I, I truly have fun playing last night. I think I had more fun than the audience. <laughs> I'll vouch least, for that. Or, <laughs> or at least, or at least as I mean, we much, were having a great you know? time, but you, you Yeah, know, I was favorite. having a ball, and, and I love it like that. You know, my musicians are having a ball, and, you know, it's a fun thing, but when it gets into something else...